Yo, this is the type of shit that you ain't up on. This is the type of shit that we grew up on. The type of shit that killers play in their whip so loud. When shit's about to go down, so lanes get the fuck off. Animals on the loose, you should have left us in the cage. The shoes don't be fucking, I ain't referencing my chase. Out violently, it really erodes away at their um, sense of empathy, at their sense of compassion, and it really turns human beings into objects. But again, it's for this small group of people already considering acting out violently. What's up guys, this is Audie Murphy, and tonight we're going to talk about video game violence. So some of the MSM, lately and historically, have pointed to video games as a cause for violence in youth particularly. I can recall a number of school shootings attributed to Call of Duty as the primary franchise of note here. The primary arguments at work here are twofold. First, that kids don't have the ability to clearly distinguish fantasy from reality. And second, that those predisposed towards mental illness or violence would be inclined to manifest said violence as a result of playing these games. So to address kids specifically first, I don't feel that kids lack the ability to discern fantasy from reality. Uh, not one bit. I think that kids are uniquely blessed with rich imaginations, the ability to entertain rich and vivid fantasy in a way that we as adults have beat out of us over the years. I can remember loosely what it was like as a kid to have full access to that imagination, and I wish I could have it back. Kids have creative vision that would put the most prolific fantasy writers to shame, and frankly I think it's a crime that Western society doesn't tap that resource in the least, like other societies do, uh, quite to the contrary. We discourage it. We tell our kids to live in the real world, and in so doing, we train our children upon the defined past set for us, and there are few crimes so great or so damaging in the long term as the killing of a dream. Dreams are really what we need right now, more than anything. You know, every great social pariah, every great change in society was built upon such a dream. I do not think it to be any accident that we seek to crush them so early as a society. To speak to mental illness directly, this is a pandemic issue in the states that we don't like to talk about. The harsh reality here is that we have a mental health epidemic, and yet we don't even have the social net in place to give returning veterans adequate mental health care, much less the general public. This is a national level financing issue that's gotten ignored for 40 years running, and for the record, I don't think that level of consistency is a coincidence either. So why is the media after PC gamers, especially, trying to try to demonize us? To try to paint us as a cast of obese, intellectually void, useless, pimply-faced slobs living in our mother's basement? The fact is, many in the gaming community are much more educated and intelligent than the media likes to imply. Within the PC community especially, the title of neckbeard is mostly well-earned. Gamers in their 30s and 40s who grew up through the technology revolution and the emergence of the home desktop can remember vividly just how much and how rapidly that revolution occurred. DX11 and advanced particle physics is just one result of that revolution. Facebook, Twitter, other social media and communications tools are another. And the explosion of wealth over the past three decades is a third. As a cult of neckbeards, we have been at the forefront of this revolution basking in the warm glow of its corporal forms. We have watched in stunned and reverent silence as the world has changed fantastically and irretrievably. Every morning we log on to Reddit, Twitter, or Facebook, and we read about the world in new and incredible ways. We interface with leading theologists, architects, media personalities, and scientists of every coat in ways that we might have thought impossible ten years ago. The social and economic frameworks of society are evolving. 
free media is emerging. Indeed, we have access to near any information we so desire at our fingertips. Little can be hidden anymore, and so much as a result is propagandized. The disparity between the independent media and the MSM has grown, just as the disparity between rich and poor has. The growth of the internet has fueled our rapid development and progress every bit as much as crude oil in its own way. And as PC gamers, we are in a better position than any to understand this. Many of us have been in the front row from the opening scene. It is a privileged seat, and one that has offered us a unique first glimpse at the world behind the curtain. A world where any truth is accessible to those who would seek it out. A world where technology has enabled us to find the core desires for learning and understanding. What we find there is much like being a kid again. Some of us have used these gifts to dream of a new world of high technology, and some have given us the gifts of a great future. Some have used this insight to travel into the places where even the grittiest warrior would tread very lightly, and thereby given all citizens the ability to see into places where many would dare not look. Many of these journalists have paid for this quest with their lives. This is not the result of our addiction to Call of Duty Battlefield. Games are not leading us down this road, but they might reflect just how far down this road we've already gone. PC gamers are demonized because of what we represent. A new emerging class of nouveau intelligentsia. With the ear of information full swing, we have the tools at our disposal to understand better than ever the way the world has evolved into its current form. In this blanket classification of gamers, we have the largest assembled group of educated professionals and wise and scholars in the Western world. We also represent a broad vivisection of society, the rich and the poor, men and women of all races, beliefs, and origins. We all share this passion for gaming, for technology, and we all share the dream of a better world. We have all seen, or can passively observe, the darkness of war in ways previously only lived on the front. And to our credit, we have not fallen into a world of conflict since the time of the last great war. The last threat of a dire conflict between the East and the West faded 40 years ago when the U.S. public refused to be drafted into a war they did not support. And the draft will likely never be used again. But now there is no longer any need. What has emerged in its place is a standing army of monolithic proportions, one of such weight as has not been seen since the Persian Empire. Rather than bearing spear and scabbard, our elite forces bear the most advanced armaments the money can buy. Comparatively speaking, our army is an entire fighting force of Persian immortals. Even in the rear of the vanguard, there is none among them who is not at their core an elite shock trooper. Backed by supreme intelligence nets, drone overwatch, and support from Apaches, close air support at every 1,000 meters leading up to the AC-130 circling overhead, there is no army on this earth that we could not destroy in traditional combat. The truth is, if we were to so set loose this force upon the entire world, piece by piece, we could win every theater engagement necessary to make a one world empire by force a possibility. This is our newest strategic doctrine, a standing force necessary to engage in any theater contingency and emerge victorious and relatively intact as a capable fighting force on the other side. It begs the question as to why Afghanistan has been such a realm, but when it has been, my friends. While the shadow of our drones and long-range delivery systems still hang over that place, our footprint is rapidly fading. And make no mistake of who will claim victory there. The Taliban is no longer our fiercest opponent in the region. We have created a far more brutal regime there in ISIS. It is only a matter of time now until the winter snow melts and the fighting season resumes again. The next push on the capital will be a big one. And when ISIS tanks rest prone in the streets of Kabul, as their former interior ministers have long said, all will be lost in Afghanistan. We are, by our own admission, creating our own worst enemy. 
and destabilizing much of the Middle East in the same way we did Nicaragua, Chile, Panama, and Vietnam years ago, and likely with the same motivation and end result. We tried in Cuba too, but failed, and in the news lately we see the lifting of 40 years of post-Cold War sanctions and isolation as a result of that. So why do we lose in Afghanistan? Well, quite simply, because we were never fighting to win. We never had enough troops on the ground, any retired military officer could tell you that. It was not fought like any war in history. It's pretty apparent that rather than a desire to stabilize the region, we are creating future opponents as a rationale to continue to grow the military industrial complex beyond even its already obscene bounds. No games weren't the cause of this. We are a nation steeped and raised in war, more so than any other nation on the planet today. Though many do not experience it directly, that disconnection does not change the truth of us as a people. We passively accept it, seek to glorify it, to exemplify our recent campaigns as further acts of heroism, and point to sacrifices on the ground as examples of that heroism. But here's the truth. No Medal of Honor winner, no Navy Cross winner, no real war hero ever wants to be a real war hero. Every real war hero is haunted by the tragedy of what we honor them for. All would prefer if that great day of historic service never happened. For what happened to in its wake. Medals don't raise the dead, nor do they ease that burden. The real star Naughty Murphy is a war hero to any definition of the term, and even he struggled with post-traumatic depression. An actor and writer in his later years, he became known as the real John Wayne, for actually being the presence that Wayne aspired to encompass in many of his roles. The last poem Audie Murphy wrote was in 1968. Dusty old helmet, rusty old gun, they sit in the corner and wait. Two souvenirs of the Second World War that have witnessed the time and the hate. Mute witness to a time of much trouble, where kill or be killed was the law. Were these implements used with high honor? What was the glory they saw? Many times I've wanted to ask them, now that we're here, all alone. Relics all three of that long ago war. Where has freedom gone? Freedom flies in your heart like an eagle. Let it soar with the winds high above, among the spirits of soldiers now sleeping. God, with care and with love. I salute my old friends in the corner. I agree with all they have said. And if the moment of truth comes tomorrow, I'll be free, or by God, I'll be dead. Thank you.